Hi, I'm Drew Bannon, co-founder at DBT Labs, and I love databases. Uh, so last year, I started building my own database, and I want to talk to you today about how databases work. So the goals of this presentation are very much around demystification and building an intuition. It's not about academic rigor or sweating any of the details. Uh, so we're going to keep it high level, and again, we're going to focus on uh, intuition. So my database is called DBDB stands for Drew Bannon's database. It's a pure Python implementation. I don't use any external libraries. And uh, it comes with basic SQL support and a handwritten SQL grammar, as well as a custom file format that I called uh, Drew's Universal Message Buffer, or DUM for short. The cool thing about building a database is, is you can call stuff whatever you want. Uh, so this file format supports a, a binary data structure. It's columnar in nature. And it supports column encoding and compression. And if you're not familiar with what any of this means, that's OK. That's what we're going to talk about today. So at a high level, databases parse SQL queries, build operator graphs, they optimize that graph, and then they execute the graph. And so we're not going to talk about the SQL parsing in too much detail. It's an awesome topic, uh, but we just don't have the time today. And instead, we're going to start by talking about an operator graph and what that means and what it does. So here we have an example SQL query. We're concatenating your first name and your last name. We're adding a filter, you know, on first name equals Drew for me. We're selecting from a table called people. And so you can see down here, this is the operator graph. So first, we're going to scan our table people. We're going to filter where first name is Drew. We're going to project our concatenated full name, and then we'll limit to the first 10 results. So let's focus on this table scan operator. So the fundamental problem we want to solve here is that we want to store some data in a file that our database can read and write. And our goal is to make it really, really fast. So the thing to understand is that in a database, a lot of the time spent is actually reading data from storage, especially when you have really big data sets. Usually a much smaller proportion of the time is spent on computing something like concatenating your first name and last name. So let's think about how to optimize reading from storage. The first thing we can do is we can store our data in columns instead of rows. So this might be familiar if you've used a columnar database or heard of a columnar database before. But to lay it out here, say we get a query like select first name from people. This query only cares about the column first name. And so it doesn't care at all about user ID or last name. So what we want to do is we want to avoid reading the data in the user ID and last name columns because they're not pertinent to this query. So if you use a file format like a CSV or JSON or something like that, that actually won't cut it for this use case. With the CSV file, you need to read the entire file you know, into memory. And then you can scan the first name column and throw away everything else. But you don't want to do that because it's kind of prohibitively slow. right? We would only want to read the first name column. And so instead, what we'll do is we'll create this file format with a table header and a data section. So our table header will store our column names and types. And it will also store offsets into the data. So let's look at what that means. Here, we've got our same query, you know, select first name from people. And we can see that in the table header, there's a first name column. It's of type string. And here we have a pointer into the data for the first name column. So we can follow this pointer. And you know, this is 0x456, but it doesn't matter what it says. Um, it's actually just pointing into a segment of the data in the column. And so here we have, um, you know, we can traverse this pointer to see uh, the column data, Drew, Alice, and Bob. And so in this way, we can read the entire header, but then only read segments of the column data and optimize the amount of data that we read, and thus optimize the performance of the query. The second thing we can do is we can compress our data. And so the goal of compression is to make data take up less space. The less data you store, the less data you have to read, and the faster your query runs. And so the big insight here is that the more that you know about a data set, the more you can compress it. So here, let's take a column like is returned, and let's say that only 5% of our orders are returned for our e-commerce business. So we have a lot of false, false values and only some true values. Here, we can compress this data by encoding more information about the nature of the column. So instead of storing false, 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 true, we can store false times 5, true times 1, false times 3. The end result is that we're storing about 50% of the amount of data that we would have stored in the sort of raw format uh, of falses and trues. So this is a type of impression, uh, compression that we call a column encoding. Specifically, it's called a run length encoding because we store you know, a run of false values of length 5. This is a great way to compress data, shrink the amount of data that we store in a file, and therefore speed up 
the amount of time the query takes to run. So we can look at another type of encoding. This is called dictionary encoding. And the big idea is that if you're storing large string values like United States of America or Canada, you're wasting a lot of space by storing these same values over and over and over again. So instead, we can store our data in an encoded manner where we start with a dictionary, where we say, you know, dictionary value one means United States of America, dictionary value two means Canada, and then we can store only the pointers into this dictionary. So we store one, two, one, three, two, one, which maps back to United States of America, Canada, USA, and so on. And so again, in this toy example, we're storing about 50% of the amount of data that we would have stored in the raw format. So this is a dictionary encoding of the data. Now, there are other types of encoding too. Run length and dictionary are pretty popular, but uh, whatever kind of encoding you use in a column, the goal is, again, just to shrink the amount of data that you're storing in, in the table. OK, the last way that we can make database queries really fast is to avoid reading data altogether if we don't have to. And so what we can do is when we store data in a column, we can also store statistics about that column. So let's say that we have a column called favorite number with values like 2, 15, 7, 6, 99, 87, so on. What we can do is we can chunk these into row groups, we can call them, or sometimes they're called pages, if you, if you hear that term. It's the same idea. And so here we have a group of four records, but typically a row group would be about 128 megabytes. So, you know, very, very big compared to what you're seeing in this example. But either way, we can store the minimum value and the maximum value in that row group. And so here we see the min is 2, the max is 15. The, and for the second row group, the min is 67, and the max is 99. So when we get a query like select first name from people where the favorite number is 10, we can actually use these column statistics to identify if there are rows in the row group that are pertinent to our query. And so here we can see, yes, you know, the first row group is pertinent. Favorite number equals 10 is between 1 and 15. So there are rows in here that end up mattering for us. But here, we know that the minimum value is 50 and the maximum value is 99. So there are no rows in this row group that are pertinent to us. We can skip reading uh, this row group entirely. And again, if this was 128 megabytes of data, you can imagine how this would significantly speed up the amount of time uh, spent reading data and therefore processing your query. OK, so let's get back to operators. We talked about the table scan operator and some of the techniques that we use to speed up queries. But let's talk about how operators like filters, projections, and limits work. So there's only really a few operators that you would need to implement if you're building a database. And these are going to sound familiar, like filter, join, aggregate, sort, limit, because these are the uh, like the keywords that you see in SQL syntax. So a database takes that SQL select statement, translates it to these operators, and executes them. So we can look at a filter operator, for example. And here we get you know input data. Maybe this comes from a, a table scan operator or a join or something like that. And we feed it into our filter operator which says where first name equals Drew. And so the operator emits any rows that match that, um, we would call this a predicate, or match that filter. So here we see we put three rows into the operator and get one row out of the operator. Sometimes you're able to reorder uh, how these operators actually run. So let's take this example where we have a table scan of a, a table called people with a million rows in it. We're going to aggregate that to you know, count the number of people by their first name or something like that. And then we're going to filter for only the records where the name is Drew. So this is really wasteful. And we can actually swap these two operators. And the big insight here is that if you filter the data before aggregating it, then you're only going to aggregate the data that you actually care about for the query. So you're not going to do wasted work. You're going to uh, return a result faster, which is our goal in building a database. So. Let's imagine swapping these two operators, and we'll, we'll do what we call push down the filter predicate, the filter operator. And here we take our original 1 million rows from people operator, or people table, I should say, and we apply our filter, which reduces this down to 100 rows, and then we aggregate. So here we're only aggregating 100 rows instead of a million rows, and as you can imagine, this is going to be a lot faster than the previous version of this query. OK, so uh, let's put all together and actually show off what building a database looks like. And so you can see here a sort of like uh, interface into DBDB. Um, so the first thing we can do is we can take a query like this. We're going to select a couple columns, user ID, first name, last name, we'll limit 10. We can go ahead and explain this query. And so here we see our operators. And remember, I'm not calling people dumb here. The file format is called dumb. Uh, people are very smart and nice in general, I found. Um, so. We've got our operators. There's a table scan, a projection, and a limit. We can actually go ahead and execute this query. And so what we see is that our table scan 
processes a thousand rows from the people table. It's about 14 kilobytes of data. And it read 22 pages or row groups, if you remember. We pass that data onto the projection, which in this case is not doing anything. It's just projecting user ID, first name, and last name. And then we limit it to the first 10 results. So you can see that the limit operator processed 1,000 records, but emitted only 10. So we flick over to the results uh, uh, tab here. We can actually see you know, 10 people in the people table. Um, so let's take one of them, and we'll add a filter. And we'll say where first name equals Tina. So we can go ahead and explain this query. And here we can see that we get a filter operator added to our operator graph. And so just as before, we can execute this query. And now we see that the filter operator received 1,000 rows, emitted four rows, and then projected them. And so here you go. These are all of our Tina records in the people table. Finally, I want to show you a uh, more complete example. And so this is going to be a bigger query in which we do a join. We're also going to group by a couple of columns and aggregate a count of friends. So let's go ahead and explain this one more time. And here we can see that there's two table scans. So we get a table scan on the people table and a table scan on the friends table. We're going to join these tables together, aggregate, sort, and limit. And if all goes well, we can execute this query. And we can see that the join runs and it aggregates data. If we flick to the results table, uh, there you go. Here's, here's data. So uh, super high level, that's how to build a database. Um, one thing that's important to know is that databases are never finished. They're only abandoned. Um, I had a ton of fun with this project and I'm excited to show it off to the world today. Um, I also learned a ton as I as I went through all this stuff, a ton of things that I thought I understood that I realized I didn't really understand until it was time to implement them uh, myself. So there's more work to do and I'd love to flesh out the SQL parser. I'd love to actually build a database optimizer. That part doesn't exist yet. And uh, I think it'd be really cool to run this as a distributed database on a bunch of Raspberry Pis uh, sitting on my desk. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Um, so if you want to follow along, you can follow me on uh, X, formerly Twitter. I'm at Drew Bannon. And uh, otherwise, thanks so much for listening. I hope this was interesting and informative. Thank you.